That's what the book says, amen. I'm a believer. I said I'm a believer. And I believe in this Bible. King James. Amen. I want to preach to you tonight on the grace of God, the story of Mephibosheth. I'm going to read to you a chapter that I want all of you never to forget. If you haven't marked it in your Bible, I want you to mark it tonight. As I read, just put a mark, put a date at the head of the chapter number 9, 2 Samuel. I'll put a mark of some kind at this chapter. Never forget the story of this lame prince, the grandson of Saul, the son of Jonathan, to whom David showed the kindness of God for Jonathan's sake. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant, whose name was Zeba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Zeba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul left that I may show the kindness of God unto him. And Zeba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son who is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Zeba answered the king and said, Behold, he is in the house of Mecca, the son of Amiel, in the land of no bread and poverty and want, named Lodibar. And King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mecca, the son of Emiel, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, now there's the name of this lame prince, I would not guarantee the pronunciation that I've just given it. Uh, you, you actually don't know whether I've correctly pronounced it or not. Neither do I. And I said that to encourage you not to become discouraged with these impossible Hebrew words. They're hard for we Gentile people to pronounce. I, uh, a French word sometimes is hard for me to, to uh, pronounce. We just don't say things in the South like they say the same things anywhere else in the world, in fact. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I think I have the pronunciation correct. I was preaching at Makata Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia, in a, bio, in a missionary conference a few years ago. And in my scripture, I was going to find the word Genesaret, Lake Genesaret. And as I read down, I knew I just had a premonition that when I arrived at that word, I'd not be able to pronounce it. And I kept on reading, knowing that I was headed to that dead end. I was headed to a collision. I knew it, and my brakes wouldn't hold. I just, not a thing I could do about it. And sure enough, when I got to the word, I couldn't have said it. I could not have said it, and my life depended upon it. And I turned to the pastor behind me, and I said, say it for me. And that's embarrassing. <laughs> and he said, Genesaret. And then I said, Janessa Redding kept on reading my scripture. But I thought when I continued reading Luke, why couldn't you not just as well said uh, Galilee? <laughs> Same lake. Lake Janessa is Galilee. So all of us have a little trouble every once in a while with these big words from the Hebrew tongue. And Mephibosheth is one of those words. Now he, uh, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, Jonathan rather, the son of Saul, in the Bible, there are no grandsons. They're all son of Jonathan and son of Saul. That's an interesting thing to me. And I, I think the reason for that is that in technicality, there is no such thing as a grandson. Your blood component comes from the gene of the male and not the female. All of us have many components in our body. But we all have a mobile unit, a mobile component, five quarts of blood. And that one mobile unit, the only mobile unit, in fact, you have in your body is your blood. And it circulates from the top of your head to the sole of your foot every 30 seconds of your life, whether you're sleeping or walking. A miracle, that blood. And I'm told in Leviticus 17, 11, that the life of my flesh is in the blood. Not in my heartbeat, nor my skeleton, nor my muscle nor any organ of my body, but the life of my flesh is in the blood. And that part of my body comes from the male gene. And I marvel at that. Which is to say that the blood in my body is the blood of my dad. I attended the funeral of my one of my great aunts, the last surviving member of my granddaddy's family last Monday. And I stood there, she's buried less than 20 feet from my red-headed granddaddy, 
And uh, I thought as I stood there and, and just uh, six or eight feet away from his grave is my great-granddaddy and 20 feet down from their graves is my great-great-granddaddy. Three of my granddaddies in one cemetery and my daddy's buried in Greenville. This is out from Columbia. And I thought to myself, I am him in that I have his blood. And then I transmitted that blood to my son. My wife gave my son his body and carried my son and gave birth. But I supplied the genes that produced his blood. He in turn has given to me a son we call grandson. But in actuality, my grandson has the same blood in his body that I have in mine. My daughter has the same blood in her body that I have in mine. Now that's a miracle, a scientific miracle. And that could be the reason that in the scriptures there are no grandsons. The Bible is wiser than the scientists to know. It's the son of Jonathan and the grandson of Saul. If that is the answer that I don't know any other answer to give you. But when he was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, but I will surely show thee kindness, uh, the kindness of God for Jonathan thy father's sake, and I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. Actually, we will say our, your grandfather. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Now, there's a good Baptist word in the Old Testament. That's eternal life. You don't find a Methodist word in the Bible anywhere. You don't find a PT word and a PTL word in the Bible anywhere. They're all Baptist words. Thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And Mephibosheth bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? A few years ago at Tabernacle, I, I brought a message for seven consecutive Sunday morning on the seven most classic statements in all the Bible. And I made my own selection. And among those that I selected was the great testimony of Ruth. In chapter 1 of the book of Ruth, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor from following after thee, for thou art just our lodge, thy people shall be my people, thy God shall be my God, where thou diest, I want to die, and treat me not to leave thee, nor depart from following after thee. I think that's one of the most classic statements in all literature, Bible or out of the Bible. Then I chose also that great statement of David in 1 Samuel 17 when he said, Is there not a cause? What a tremendous statement that is. But among the seven, I use that verse, verse 8. What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? And the king said unto Ziba, Saul's servant, uh, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all of his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring him the fruit, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth shall eat bread always, as another good Baptist word, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Zebra had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Zebra unto the king, according to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Now that's the scripture. Now the subject, the grace of God, the story of the fellow said. Now I'm aware of the fact that I could never tell the grace of God like it ought to be told. I don't know that any man could stand and extol the virtue of God's grace and describe the glory of God's grace. Adjectives fail the most wise of us, the most skilled of us. Words fail us to tell the untellable and to describe the indescribable. How could you describe the glory of a sunset to a man who could not see, who was totally blind? You'd never find words sufficient to describe the glory of a beautiful sunset, would you? Uh, you, you you'd might as well attempt to try to hug a mountain as to try to tell the grace of God in all of its full degree. That's why you sang a moment ago, a fresh and a new amazing grace, how sweet the sound. We sing it over and over and over again and never feel that we've sung it like it should have been sung and that we've told it like it ought to be told. And I've preached about grace time and time again down through these years, but I confess to you, I don't know that I've ever told the grace of God like I'd love to be able to tell it. An impossible task. And yet I attempt to do again what I've tried to do many times in my life, to tell the untellable and to describe the indescribable and to preach 
the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus, our Lord. I was preaching in Highland Park in Chattanooga in a meeting and stayed in the prophet's chamber. And I went out one day for my noonday meal and I locked the door and went and had my meal and came back and locked the door, a two-room apartment, and I stepped into the kitchen. But I heard somebody in the other room playing the piano. And I wondered who had the key. I thought I had the key only to the apartment for those several days. But I looked inside the door to the other room and at the piano sat Dr. Charles Weigel, the blessed man who wrote, No one ever kept me like Jesus, a garden of roses. I sing of thee when I stand at the edge of eternity and about 200 other famous and beautiful gospel hymns. And I surmised that he was picking out the melody of a new hymn and I dare not disturb him. I slipped back into the room and sat down and waited and waited and waited. I guess 30 maybe, maybe 30 minutes while the great master songwriter picked out the melody of what I suspected to be a new song. But after a while the music stopped and I got up and walked into the room, and there greeted Dr. Weigel, who had been at Tabernacle, whom I knew, at least in a casual way, and I said, Dr. Weigel, what are you doing, sir? And he was glee in his eyes, and at that time was a man 90 years old, died five years later at the age of 95. What about that? Lived a long life with glee and a sparkle in his eye, and with enthusiasm in the tone of his voice, he reported to me, I'm writing a new song. And I thought to myself, though I didn't say to him, if I could have written, no one ever cared me like Jesus, I do believe I would have retired. <laughs> Most beautiful hymn surely ever written. No one ever cared me like Jesus. But there, the old master sat at the piano, picking out the melody of another song. And I said, sir, what's the title? And he said, oh, what glory. That's the title. Oh, what glory. And he said, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in the morning service, in the conference, I plan to sing this song in public for the first time. And I said, sir, if I'm alive, I'll be there. And the next morning at 10 o'clock, I was there. And he stood and sang that song for the first time in public. And God blessed it. And I saw, I, I think conservatively, 50, maybe 100 preachers on their feet shouting and praising God in that great church that Dr. Weigel sang publicly for the first time. Oh, what glory. Now, that wasn't the first time that he tried to tell the grace of God. But he simply repeated, repeated what he had tried many times to do and no doubt felt as you feel and felt as I feel that maybe I can do a better job the next time I try to tell it. And so I feel that way when I take the subject that I've selected tonight, the grace of God. Now, there are four things in this scripture that I want to call to your mind. Number one, grace is God loving unlovely sinners. Number two, grace is God giving Christ to die on the cross for unlovely sinners. And then third, grace is God lifting out that which cannot lift itself. And then number four, grace illustrated by the chapter that I read to you a moment ago. Uh, you have my sermon in a four-word nutshell. Grace is God loving. Grace is God giving. Grace is God Lifted. And then four, grace illustrated in the chapter. Now the first of those, grace is God loving. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Isn't that a marvel? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Isn't that tremendous? He loved me before I knew him. He loved me from the foundation of the world. He loved me when I was undeserving and unlovely. He loved me when I groped for the wall like a blind man. He loved me before I was ever conceived in my mother's womb. He loved me when I was born. He loved me when I was born again. He loved me when he called me to preach. He loved me in these 35 years that I've been trying to preach. He loved me when he gave me a good family. He loved me when he gave me a good church. He loved me when he brought me to this place tonight. He loves me as I stand to preach another time. But God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son. I don't believe that there's one person in North Carolina beyond the scope of that love. Any sinner, vile and wretched as they may be, is included in God's great love. Everybody. You find the most vile person living in Reedsville or in this county and declare to that person, God loves you, and you've declared gospel truth. No question about that. I don't think there's anybody in this county whom God does not love. God does not will any man perish, 
But God wills that men repent and become converted as you are and as I am to be saved. God loves the world of sinners and vile sinners. Now I don't understand how God could love a good man, a clean man, a good woman. No doubt in my heart, but what? In this building, this moment, some of the finest people ever to live now sit and worship God, and I'm glad you're here. And I have that kind of confidence in you. These that came along are some of the finest folk I've ever known in my life. I may comprehend how God could love these good people. But when I know that the love of God is infinitely greater than that, then I stand amazed. I stand amazed at that. I received a letter from Owen in Greensboro, that's close by where you live. And that woman wrote to me something like this. She said, I'm 55 years old. I've been married and divorced three times. I'm a drunkard and I'm a doper. I've had six children. Three of them died as infants because of a social disease in my body. I'm so vile and rich that until I hesitated to write, I didn't want you to handle the paper that I had to handle to write the letter to you. I'm the meanest and most vile woman in the city of Greensboro, she said in the letter. Now, you don't get a lot of letters like that by radio. I've been at the radio now for more than 40 years. And occasionally you'll get a sinner like that on the gospel hook. But most of the time you get minners, little sinners, children, and little sinners. But occasionally you'll get a whale. We got a whale that day. And when I read that letter, tears came to my eyes, and I sat down to my typewriter, and I wrote that woman back, and I reported to her, there's a bomb in Gilead. I said, there's a sympathizing Savior. I said to her, though your sin be a scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And I believe I told her the truth. And I put those good reports in a letter and sent it back to the lady in Greensboro. And a few days later, I received another letter. She said, I know what you're talking about now. I'm now saved. Isn't that wonderful? She accepted Jesus and got saved. I marveled at that. And she kept writing to me. And I marveled as she did. But a few years after that, let me give you a climax of that story that is a miracle. I had no idea I was going to run into this kind of a thing. But I was preaching... At, at, in the Greensboro area and a pastor friend said if you'll meet me at the Eston W cafeteria when it used to be downtown you remember that I've eaten there many a time with Brother Gaulden and other preachers that I preached for Brother Perry Ross uh, back in those days in Greensboro and uh, I met him 12 noon Saturday and we went through the line and going through the line I told the preacher the story that I told you about that woman and I said to myself maybe he can visit her. God gave me that climax and I thank God for it. Two or three years after that, he gave me another climax to that story. I preached on a Sunday morning at the Tabernacle, and a lady walked up and said, Do you know me? And I said, Ma'am, I'm sorry. I think I should know you, and I apologize. I couldn't call your name. She said, You remember the woman in Greensboro? And in a flash, it all came to me. And I said, You're the woman. She said, I'm the woman. She said, I drove 200 miles today to tell you that it's still good. <laughs> And we had another shouting smell right from the bullpen. It's ever. Grace is God loving unlovely sinners. Aren't you glad for that? God loves the down and out. Over at Tabernacle, Melvin, years ago, I baptized a woman. And somebody slipped up to me and said, Do you know who you baptized, preacher? And, oh, yes. I said, I so and so. And I called the lady. Oh, you don't understand. And I knew I was going to hear something sure enough. You don't understand. When you hear that, you know something's coming. So he told me, I had baptized one of the most popular prostitutes in Greenville. And when it was reported to me that she was a prostitute, I agreed in my soul, but in my heart I liked to have a spell. I was so glad, not that she was a prostitute, but that God had saved her. And now I had baptized her. And she's still a member of Tabernacle. And there she's old and feeble now. I can hardly get around. Up in the 70s, late 70s. But every time she comes in, I feel like getting up and walking the aisles and praising God. They got little sinners like that. I wish I could baptize a regiment of Harlem. Grace is God loving, unlovely sinners. Don't you ever forget that? Nobody's beyond the scope of God's divine love.
But second, grace is God giving Jesus. Grace is God loving. But grace go, goes the second step. Grace is God giving. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his only begotten son to die, to be a perpetuation for our sins, to say it like the Bible does. For God so loved the world that he came. He did something about it. He proved. But God has commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God didn't wait until I started preaching to die for me. God didn't wait until I started living right to die for me. But God died for me and you while we were yet sinners. Did you get that? And some of you brethren were wretched sinners. But such were some of you. But now you're justified. Now you're sanctified. Now you're saved. But Christ died for you when you were not justified. He loved you when you were a sinner. Your brother Vendable became sick with a kidney ailment. And the doctor diagnosed the case and said, Brother Vendel, you're going to have to have a kidney transplant or die. And that's becoming a quite common thing. We've had several folk at Tabernacle with kidney transplants in the last few years. Quite common. Well, I know what Dean would do, and I know what Mrs. Vendel would do. They say to the doctor, if you can get one of our kidneys to work in my husband or my daddy, we'll give one of our kidneys. And then and this boy and Mrs. Bindle would have to think about it and pray about it. At the drop of the hat, I know what they'd do. And I'm sure some of the men of this church would step forward. Some of the good singers, some of the good deacons, some of the younger men would say, Now, uh, uh, Doctor, if you can use my kidney to spare the life of my preacher, then I'll be glad to become a kidney donor. I wouldn't be surprised at that at all. And some of you would do that. But grace goes infinitely further than that. I think I can understand why you do that for your pastor. But suppose the wine old downtown. I, I noticed a picture of an old dilapidated building in Greenville. And they've been trying to get it torn down. And nobody uh, wants to bother the uh, money to even tear it down. And, and the folk around there say it's a haven for the wine olds And a haven for the gamblers. And a haven for the drunks. And they go in there and sleep at night. In an old half burned down building. And they want it torn down. It's a haven for rats and, and uh, that kind of off scowlings of society. Congregate in that place and gamble and drink their wine at night. You wouldn't even go in the place, let alone uh, a clean person wouldn't go in the place. To say nothing of going there sleeping at night. So one of those fellows came down with kid to failure. Where is the man that will step forward? I don't think I would. If my ch child needed my kidney, if if it was usable, I'd donate it. But I don't think I'd give a kidney to a wino. I don't think I'd give a kidney to a prostitute. If they were going to continue their liquor drinking and their uh, harlot tray, I don't think I'd give them my kidney. Don't think you would either. In fact, I wouldn't recommend it. But my soul, aren't you glad God's greater than that? I know God loves Brother Vindolo. But God loves that wine old too. God loves that drunk. God loves every man. And God so loved the down and out until he gave Jesus. And that's grace. And that's amazing grace. That's why we sing it. We can't tell it. We try to sing it. We can't preach it. We try to sing it. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And then third, grace is God lifting that which cannot lift itself. Have you ever watched the spider weave a web? Have you wondered why the spider weaves that web? As a garment to clothe his body? No. As a house in which to dwell? No. As a demonstration of his skill to do what a human hand cannot duplicate? No. Why does the spider weave the web? Only one answer. The spider weaves the web as a snare and a trap. The spider knows as soon as Mr. Fly will come by. And Mr. Fly will say, that's beautiful. I'm going to light on that web and I'll enjoy its beauty and precision. And he does. And in a moment he says, I'll fly away. And when he attempts to fly away, he then discovers his legs are entangled in those silky cords. He turns them desperately. But the more he turns his legs, the more entrapped he is. 
He flaps his wings in great desperation, and they also become ensnared and trapped. He lies over exhausted, and here comes the spider with the greatest of ease to devour the prey. Now you might have watched that drama and out of pity for an insect, you might have reached down and lifted the fly out and he flew away and he did as he did, as if to say, thank you, mister, for lifting me out. If you hadn't lifted me out, I'm a goner. Well, something like that happened to me and you. We were ensnared with sin. We were ensnared with religion. We were ensnared by sin. We were ensnared by popular opinion. And then one day the Savior came by while we were turning our legs and did for me and you what we couldn't do for ourselves. He lifted me out from the deep miry clay and I settled my feet upon the rock to stay. Grace is God lifting what could not lift itself. Can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Never. Can the leopard change his spot? Never. No no more can a sinner convert himself. We're all dependent upon the grace of God. He lifted me out. He'll lift you out. And then fourth, grace illustrated. I'm going to turn the curtains of about three millenniums back. A century at a time. About 30 centuries. David lived about a thousand B.C. in round figures. And we'll turn those centuries back. And as we do, we find ourselves in the palace of King David, the first house built in Jerusalem after the Jezebusites were dislodged, was a house for Solomon, for David. You remember how Samuel had told the people that's exactly what would happen, and they'd pay for it. If you get a king, you're going to have to pay. But the people said, we want a king. God said, let them go, Samuel. And they went. And David built him a house in Jerusalem. Saul had done the same thing. But David built him a palace. And believe it or not, after David was firmly established for seven years, his kingdom was decided, divided between he and his, uh, Isbaseth. But finally, Isbaseth, Abner, his general, is out of the way. Joab killed Abner, you know. And Abner died the death of a fool. And now that's out of the way. And Isbaseth is uh, Saul's son. Uh, is out of the way and now David consolidates the kingdom and he builds himself a palace in Jerusalem and establishes the ancient city and when David was, was the king of the twelve tribes believe it or not he began to search from Dan to Bathsheba for every living descendant of Saul his bitter enemy and he brought them in one by one every son every grandson every nephew one by one to show the kindness of God to them for Jonathan's sake. And that's why David is called a man after God's own heart. David did some wretched things, but he had a big heart. He was loyal to God. He never denied the faith. He always responded in the right way. He did some foolish things, but his response was always right. And you can't but admire. The more you learn about David, you have to admire him, though he's filled up with a lot of faults. So much like me and you. And yet he was a God's man, make no mistake about it. Right. And he brought them in one at a time. And he thinks his project is finished. And as I go into that throne room, I hear him say, Zeba, is there any left of the house of Saul that hadn't yet been brought in? And Zeba is just about to say, Your Majesty, you finished your work. We're all proud of you. You've been a great noble man to do that because Saul was your avowed enemy he tried to kill you and you had an opportunity to kill him several times but you spared his life but he was not that charitable to you and we all marvel at your graciousness and he's about to say your job is complete when God said Zima there's one that hadn't been brought in and God put Mephibosheth in his mind and I would imagine Zima might have argued a bit with the Lord he might have said now Lord I won't bother David about that crippled man uh, he's about to die. He's been crippled all his life. And uh, I, I, I'll make a visit. I'll do a good thing for him. And I won't bother the king. But God said, Ziba, you tell the king truth. You tell the king the truth. And so Ziba was compelled to say, Your Majesty, your job is complete with one exception. There's one that hadn't yet been brought in. And naturally, David said, Who is he? And where is he? And then Ziba said, He's Mephibosheth. 
He's in the house of Maker, the son of Emiel, down in Lodibar. And the word means the land of want and poverty and no bread. And David said, go fetch him. Go fetch him to me. Bring him to me. Bring him to me. And then I imagine Ziba said, your majesty, and I read this between the lines, if you'll bear with me, let me tell you one thing, then I'll go get him. I'll bring him to you. And then Ziba recalled to David how this young man became a cripple. A few years earlier, while Saul was king, the Philistines overran the palace, and the nursemaid picked up this baby boy in her arms, Mephibosheth, rushed out of the palace, and in her haste to flee from the Philistines, she fell and dropped that lad on the stone walkway. And as a result of that fall, his skull was fractured, his arms were fractured, his legs were fractured, paralysis set in, and the young fellow never recovered. All his life, he's been crippled, a paralytic, a helpless paralytic, because of the fall of another. You see the gospel there, don't you? Right. Well, David heard that. And even after David heard that, he said, I want you to go bring him to me. Remind us not. Bring him to me. Remind us not what kind of shape he's in. Bring him to me. Like the woman at Greensboro. Hallelujah. Bring him to me. And Ziba said, yes, your majesty. And David hitched his chariot to two of his best white horses. And the chariot's in front of the palace. And Ziba steps up aboard the chariot and says to the driver, the land of Lodibar, the house of maker, the son of Amiel. And that driver, dri chariot driver says, sir, you've got your orders crossed up. This is the king's chariot. You mean you order the king's chariot to that godforsaken land of Lodibar? You'll have to get your taxi. This is the king's chariot. Ziba said, you have your orders. Let's be going. And that day the king's chariot went down to the land of no bread. <laughs> I see the chariot leave the palace and leave the city and wind its way down the stony road south of Jerusalem to the land of Lodibar. And the people looked out of the windows and couldn't believe their eyes that the king's chariot would be in the land of Lodibar. They whispered, what does this mean? But after a while that chariot stopped before the most humble hovel of a house in Lodibar. And Ziba got off board and stepped across an unkept yard and knocked on a door that hang on one hinge. And from the inside came a weak, sick voice, come in. And he pushed that door open and stepped into that room, unkept and unclean, in the corner a bed, unkept and unclean, and on that bed, the wasted, crippled form of a young man who was the grandson of a king, but because of his condition, suffered. And he stepped over to that bed and said, uh, Is your name Mephibosheth? Yes, sir, that's my name. Are you the son of Jonathan, the grandson of King Saul? Yes, sir, Jonathan is my father and King Saul is my grandfather. Well, I'm Ziba, the servant of His Majesty King David of Israel. And I've been sent to fetch you to King David. <laughs> not me, sir. Well, look at my hands. I'd not be able to serve the king's table. I'm a paralytic. I can't handle a knife or fork. And look at my feet. I'd not be able to march in the king's army. I've been a cripple all my lifetime. You're looking for somebody else, sir. And he said, do you name of Pemisat? Yes, sir, that's my name. Well, I've come for you, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And before that lame prince could offer another objection, the chair driver picks him up like a mother would pick up a babe. Bears him out of that hovel, that loady bar land. And puts him down in the bed of the chariot from the king's palace. And he steps aboard and picks up the rein. And Zeba steps aboard with that precious cargo of a dead dog. And they leave Lodibar. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed my sins away. He found me. He found me in Lodibar. And bore me upon the arms of grace into the palace of King Jesus. And when they arrived, I preached this sermon one night at Tabernacle about 15 years, 18 years ago. And Melvin, you was probably there. And that chariot got bogged down. I tried to move it and got to shout it. 
And we shouted 10 minutes, and I said, I'm moving now. And I tried to move it the second time and shouted 10 more minutes. And I said, well, surely I can move the chariot now. And I tried it the third time and bogged down again. And brother, I threw the towel in. We shouted the fourth five minutes. I'll never get that long as I live. Coach, don't, don't tell anybody about that, please. That, uh, we're not going out of the radio, are we? That'd be awful. When you get your cassette, cut that out, please. <laughs> No, I'm glad it happened, and I'm a candidate again. Let it come, Lord. Old El Good said, I ordered, and I'm not going to cancel the order. We'll not cancel the order. If God blesses it, we'll be thankful, won't we? But anyway, they get back to the king's palace, and he's waiting. He has a pallet waiting. They bring that man in and put him on that pallet. David steps back, and the driver steps back. Ziva steps back. And David steps over and said one word. He called him by his name, Mephibosheth. I would imagine Mephibosheth had some misgivings. Maybe he's going to imprison me. Maybe he's going to take revenge on me for what my granddaddy did to him. And he didn't know what was going to happen. But when David said Mephibosheth, it was like a mother's lullaby at the midnight as she rocks a fevered baby. <laughs> glory, glory, glory. I imagine his soul said, he knows me, he knows me. I imagine he said, he's not going to bother me or harm me. There's compassion in his voice. He knows me. And then David stepped. Oh Amen, Brother Melvin. Have your said, my boy. Have your said. Amen. All right. Amen. He knows me. Then he stepped a bit closer and said, fear not. Don't be afraid. I'm sure he could look into the face of that crippled lad and know that he was afraid. He had never been in the king's presence before in his lifetime. He knew what his granddaddy was to David. Fear not. He said, I haven't brought you here to take revenge on you. He said, you don't know it. But I brought you here to show the kindness of God to you. For Jonathan's sake. When God found me, that's what, that's what, that's what he said to me. You don't deserve it, lad. You ought to go to hell. But I brought you here to show the kindness of God to you. For Jesus' sake. And it was then that Mephibosheth said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? A nobody. I mean a nobody. Amen. Amen, my brother. Amen. Why would God look on dead dogs as we are? Well, nobody in this building thinks of yourself more highly than you ought. The last one of us know that I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. Dead dogs. And then David steps back and he says to his servant, I want you to fix the East Room tonight. We have a guest. Now help yourself, brother. These folk have promised they wouldn't tell it on us. Just go ahead. Have yourself. And that night they fixed up the East Room. Not for a king, but for a dead dog. And there was a happy day when God wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when Heaven's Architect started building the mansions, came across my name and God said, Fix one for him! Fix one for him! He's a dead dog, but fix the mansion for him! Amen! Amen! <laughs> David sent another servant, Fix a plate at the king's table. And I imagine those servants looked at that sick man as if to say, David, you're a man. That fellow would be a source of embarrassment to your family. Look at his leg. Look at his hands. He can't eat by himself. He'd be a source of embarrassment, a sore thumb to your family, your wife, and kids to be ashamed of him. But you know a man's leg can be pretty fouled up. But if the tablecloth of grace covers them, they're not so bad. You take God's skirt away from me, and I'm a goner. But as long as I can hide under the table, Lord, and I'll 
die tonight under the tablecloth. God knows my legs are nothing. God knows I'm a cripple. God knows I'm no good. But when you put God's tablecloth and cover my wretchedness, then I stand pretty well. Amen. Amen. Jubilee night. Amen, Brother Bird. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Then David said, Zeba. Right, right. Just help yourself, Brother Bird. We are candidates again tonight, if God sees that. Amen. David said, Zeba, tomorrow you go down to the recorder's court and find a title deed to every foot of land that Saul ever owned. And you tell the recorder that the king says, deed it all to him. <laughs> And when you get all that deeded to my fellow says, you plow it and plant it when harvest time comes, don't put the increase in your barns. Put the increase in the barns of my fellow said. What about that? And if I were there when that happened, and it did happen, by the way, I read it. If I could have been there when that happened, I might have gotten close to my fellow said, and I might have said, my fellow said, tell me, what did you do? to cause the king to do so much for you. <laughs> and if I could Amen. You go ahead and finish my sermon for me, my brother. Help yourself. You go ahead and finish it. You go on and finish it. You know what I'm about to say. You know what I'm about to say. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. Glory. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. Right. Right. I told you these young men see visions. Hallelujah. If I could say, my fellowship, what did you do to cause David to do so much for you? He would say, in my hands, no price do I bear, but simply to thy cross I say. And I'd like to say to you tonight that I am what I am by the grace of God. And in my hand, no price do I bring. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And Calvary. And here's a tone in blood. How many of you are saved? Let's see your hand. God bless you. May we stand with our heads bowed. And our eyes closed. I wonder if there's somebody in the crowd tonight who couldn't put your hand up. And you'd like now to lift your hand and have Brother Venable and these preacher men to pray for you tonight. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody in the church unsaved? Anyone in the church unsaved? Put your hand up. Let me see it. Anybody? I know Brother Venable reaps this vineyard. I'd be a presumptuous man to imagine that I could come and reap in the vineyard that Brother uh, uh, Vendable labors in, toils in, he and uh, Brother Mike, and uh, the good men and women of the church. I don't expect that. I appreciate your church. Appreciate New Heights. God bless Brother Vendable. God bless Brother Caudle. God bless your work, your Sunday school, your singing choir. I've always, I wanted my people to hear the folks singing here. And they have tonight, and I appreciate that. Now, Lord Jesus, use the message I've tried to bring to have us each to love you a bit more because you loved us so much in an indescribable way. All that we've tried to preach and sing and shout tonight doesn't scratch the surface as far as telling what we'd like to tell about the love of God and the grace of God bestowed upon us. But we thank you for our heart. We give you thanksgiving for grace that we now enjoy. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to sing a verse of a song. If you're in the church and need to come to the altar, the pastor will meet you here. Come on now. We'll pray for you, pray with you. And then I'll turn the service back to you, pastor.